it is uh, great to be here today, and uh, I'm as always excited about this lesson because uh, we're going to, I hope, look at it a little differently, the Lord's Prayer, and think about the words as opposed to what we typically do in churches when we just recite it. Uh, there are reasons for knowing it backwards and forwards, but oftentimes we just get in the habit of repeating something and don't know what we're repeating, which at least means that we know it. But we're going to dig into the words and what they mean. And some um, information I got even uh, reading what a rabbi had to say about the words in the Lord's Prayer. I thought that was kind of an interesting um, twist on it, if you will. So next week we'll be here, and then we'll take a hiatus until January 6th. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you that you left us a model prayer. We thank you that you want us to come into your presence and make our petitions known and leave them at your throne. We also thank you that we can trust you to answer not what we want, but according to your perfect plan for our lives. Because, Father, that is what we need. And if our heart's desire is towards loving you as you would have us to do, that has to be our desire too. So cause us to want to be in your will totally. Teach us today as we study your word, and we thank you for it and the power that it has to change our lives. And it's your son's name we pray. Amen. Again, I want to go back to thinking about the author, the, the human author of this book, Matthew, and what a babe in Christ he was when he was writing this and relating to his experiences. In fact, every time I go back and restudy this, I, I'm just overwhelmed with this thought that Jesus only had three years with his disciples. And you think about making a disciple, I mean, that's a lot of work to go into. Plus, this was all new teaching, wasn't it? It was fulfilling of the old, but they had to kind of shake off some of their ideas of what the Old Testament told them. Is that how does that, you know, graft into the New Testament without being disobedient and Jesus took great pains, went into conversations with them to help them understand it. But this was a huge teaching. And it has helped me to stop and think about, as I reach out to people who are still babes in Christ, what should I expect them to know? And we do want them to grow, and they do need the meat of the word. We have to continue to build them up in the Lord, and they need to be discipled. But we also need to know, okay, this may be so new to them that they're saying, what are you talking about? <laughs> no. If you were raised in the church, as I was, you know all the jargon. But people don't. What in the world are you talking about? And God has given me a couple really good lessons, which are a little embarrassing at times because I felt like I offended the person or I didn't understand the person and I, I didn't mean to assume. But as Matthew's through the Holy Spirit, directed to write these things, I just think how excited he must have been to start to be understanding this whole God thing, if you will, and Jesus, and how the old and the new met in Christ. I also think that he must have had this feeling of, um, I've not been a very good Jew. We know that because of his job, right? You're not a tax collector for the Romans, and cheating your own people, if you're a good Jew and following the law, you weren't even good to your own people. So imagine him hearing all of this teaching. Now, the others had their own issues. They went, all up, oh, there's Peter. <laughs> but I hadn't thought of Matthew so much. as How he must have been pricked in his conscience this time. Oh, and yearning to want to understand this Jesus that's come on the scene. And grasping at every word and wanting to, how can I apply this? How can I live this out? That ought to be our heart's desire always, isn't it? How many, I mean, you don't have to raise your hands, but in your own mind, and I think I know most of you well enough, I just wonder, will I ever get there? And of course, we're not going to quite get there. I guess if we get there really close, we'll be home. But we always see, if we're honest, we examine our own lives and say, that's that really ought not to be like that. I shouldn't be having those thoughts. I ought to be more forgiving or I ought to be more diligent, whatever it is. We need to be challenged because once we think we have arrived, that's a good opportunity for the devil to say, I have an opening. You know, you think you're so good? Now let's put this out there and see how you deal with it. 
eyes have to be focused on Jesus the entire time. And so as we dig in today to this, and particularly as we talk about the Lord's Prayer, which is the model prayer, again, we are being told how to live as kingdom people. You know, I like to tell my children at school that we're helping to build them to be kingdom kids. You know, they're just not growing in their faith. I want them to be kingdom kids because they live in a different world, and they're very much aware of that. Because they know things that they're not supposed to be involved in. They hear of things when they're outside of the school and outside of church and home, which is, for the most part, Christian for them. And they're just astounded sometimes, which we want them to be. But so when you're trying to become a kingdom person, things are changing, and your focus is on the future kingdom and how it ought to look. We still have to muddle through this mess we're in. Through the power of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the scriptures, we, of course, know that we can and we're called to. But so think about, in his kingdom, what does his kingdom here on earth look like? That's how do we live. But also, as we're trying to live that out, think about when that will be, the reality of his kingdom on earth. It will all help happen, and what a glorious time that will be. And we'll be able to appreciate it. But the teaching is now so that we can build the kingdom while we're here on earth. So we talked about loving our enemies and um, <clears throat> those Easy things to do, right? Forgive those. And by the way, don't just forgive them. If they slap you, turn your cheek. And they, you know. Just had a good illustration with my students about this. We're doing the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I hope some of you have read that. But Aslan, the lion, is being dragged to what will be his death. And they're beating him and they're plucking out his beard. Okay. And I told the kids, remember what happened to Jesus? And I'm blessed to be able to recount that. I said, they pulled out his beard. When they spat on him, did Jesus spit back? Could he have gotten loose? Yeah, he can. They have good dramatic how he could get loose. I said, why didn't he? He was our model. And because he went meekly to the throne, and, or to the cross, and gave himself up, that's our model. And so when our enemy is attacking us, we're not to try to get even and say, you can't do that to me. Because we're modeling Christ. And it's for the greater purpose to see a difference in the way we live because we've been transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ and our new creations and the way he did. And so I love being able to teach that, to share that model with the students and to challenge them as we challenge ourselves to live this way. So we're talking about the next part, giving to the needy. Apropos this time of the year, isn't it? Because Every single group that you've ever given to in your life finds you at Christmas, <laughs> don't they? I mean, even all the wonderful groups. And you get you're bombarded wherever you go. Give to them, give to them, give to them. And we need to give, and we understand that. But there's a principle behind the giving. <clears throat> and we know how the Pharisees and the Sadducees did. They did it so that people would say, look at what they have given. They wanted everybody to notice. Their heart wasn't in it. Okay. But we are called as believers to give because we've been given much and not to ignore those who are in need. One of the tragic things that has happened down through the centuries is that the church hasn't totally owned their responsibility to feed the poor and to clothe those who needed it, to house the children, to take care of the orphans and the widows like the early church did. We have left it to government agencies. Now, we know how well that works. Now, we can't undo it all now. I mean, the problem is we're in this. So that's not a critique on us because we didn't really cause it. But when you think about what God was saying, if we, within our own congregation, took care, and we could easily do it if we did nothing but tithe, there would be more than enough money to take care of every family in our church or any other church, God-fearing church, to take care of the needy. And we're talking about what that looks like. But it has to come from a heart that senses we need to care for them in a genuine way. And not just say, oh, it's Christmas, I've got to give a little here. And, then. and it can't be like those who want to give and take a lot of credit for it. And how much they give to this agency and so forth. So beware. And we always want to <laughs> listen to those warnings. Because they weren't chosen accidentally. 
if we believe the scripture is inspired, then those words are inspired. It wasn't like Peter saying, I like this, and Paul saying, I like this, and John saying, and Matthew saying, well, I want to use this word. The Holy Spirit is directing them so that we get the emphasis as is necessary. When we get to the therefores, we all perk up, don't we? Oh, because of what this meant, this ought to happen. So the words are deliberate now. You can talk about all the translations and how they happened, but we know that the Holy Spirit was involved in those too. Or the word wouldn't be the word. It's been protected. So beware of practicing your righteousness before people in order to be seen of them. <laughs> now, I love this terminology. What kinds of things do we practice? If you play the piano, do you practice? Or did mom make you practice? When you didn't? How many of you played the piano? How many of you had moms that made you take piano? Yeah, yeah. I didn't. How many of you had to be made to practice? How many of you can still play? <laughs> My sister, who never had to be made, became a pianist and a great comp and composed music. She didn't have to be made to practice. Do you, you practice a new recipe, maybe, some of you who cook. You practice a sport. Oh, you pra I mean, we do practice things, don't we? But the wording, I think, is so unique. He said, beware of practicing. It's okay to practice. But are you doing it because, oh, you're watching. Okay, you're watching. Am I doing it right? Are they looking at me? Okay, I got to practice. And I, I want to make sure that you see I'm practicing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That's what he's talking about. And that's exactly what the Pharisees did. <clears throat> okay, so if you're practicing it, which you may need to do, that means you're going to get in the habit of it. What's your motivation? Mm -hmm, exactly. Well, that's ruined everything right then, hasn't it? Now, will the hungry get fed? Mm -hmm. Because I walk this <coughs> here. You're welcome. I hope you enjoy it. I don't need anything. Oh, it um, it just makes me feel so good. Did everybody notice? Okay. okay. Now, did she get fed? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, here's the. The little nuances, okay, yes, we're going to do it, but God can't use it for his kingdom's sake. He can't bless his children when we do it for ulterior motives. The person may still get fed. That's good. Because there's a lot of ulterior motives that bring about good, you know. But as kingdom people, what do we need to keep in mind? So he compares them with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, again, Matthew, having been <clears throat> brought up, in synagogue, even if he maybe wasn't dutifully attending and so forth, he's aware of the Pharisees. All the Jews knew who they were, and all the Jews, if they were honest, knew that you probably couldn't trust any of them. But they came to synagogue dutifully, and they practiced their religion, and they practiced giving because they were told to by those in charge, and then those in charge made sure that if they did it, when I have my congregation here, I'll let them know. Did you see how much I gave? You're not giving as much. You know, they could point out that. See how twisted the uh, gospel can get. And it's really not the gospel because it isn't Christ-centered. But how religion can get. And Satan, oh, he loves religion. Religion is so not threatening to him. Be as religious as you want. And he would probably encourage you to let people know because he's going to get the glory in the long run, isn't he? Humility, a humble heart before the Lord is what we're asked to have, and it applies to every part of our life. And sometimes it's not easy, and sometimes, you know, we have more difficulty in one area than the other. But he says, when you practice that, don't do it in order to be seen. For <clears throat> they have their no reward from the Father who is in heaven. The Pharisees got their reward from having everybody applaud them. Oh, look what they did. You know, God's not keeping the record of that one. But when you do it humbly, when you make sure that nobody knows you're doing it, you know, how that pleases God. You know. When I was in my, my poorest of days, single mom, and didn't know how I was going to do Christmas that particular year, something came in the mail and said, by the way, your electric bill and your water bill have been paid. 
then of course you can imagine how I bawled. No name. And when I contact, the donor wants to be anonymous. They didn't even want me to know. Do you know how badly I would have liked to thank them? But I thought later, when I was able to do the same thing for someone, do you know how good they felt? Knowing I was taken care of and my daughter was taken care of. That was what they wanted to feel. They didn't want me all gushy and stuff, because that can be embarrassing at times, too. He said, so think about your motive, and who, do you, who are you doing it for? We ought to do it out of gratitude because of all that we've been given. So he goes on to say, then when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, <laughs> as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. I mean, Jesus through Matthew is really attacking them, aren't it? It's like they, da 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 I want you to see what I'm going to give. That is not an exaggeration, or he wouldn't have used it. What it is, is that's what people around them saw. Don't you think they felt good saying, oh, Jesus is calling you out on that. <laughs> okay, That's not right. Because we know it's not right. We don't like to see that. How many of you have ever seen a person who is so arrogant, you would really like to be around them when they fall <laughs> off that pedestal? Well, that's kind of our problem if we feel that. But we're all aware of those people. So to have it pointed out, say, yes, I'm aware too. I'm aware of that kind of giving, and it doesn't amount to anything in God's kingdom and his uh, value system. So then I say to you, they have received the reward. The fanfare, that's it. That's all you get, folks. It's not eternal. We're laying up treasures for eternity, aren't we? And we're going to talk about that later, of course, in this, uh, this um, book. For when you get give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving away may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. God isn't blasting it out every time somebody does something. He's just watching, and he sees, and he's seeing your heart contrite before him, and out of an abundance you are giving to people who are in need. Not only does it please the Father, but think about, how you feel knowing you've pleased your father. Does it make you feel good to know you're pleasing your father? That's the reward, isn't it? I did something that pleases God of the universe. You know, what are the odds I can do that? <laughs> you know, so he said, you know, get your focus right. Now, it segues into what we call the Lord's Prayer, which isn't the Lord's Prayer because he didn't, this is what he recited, he's, what he gave us as a model. So I want to look at how the introduction to this is given through the Holy Spirit to Matthew. He said, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners that they may be seen by others. In the street corners even, right close to the synagogue where people can see you. They want to be seen. If I don't have an audience, I'm not going to do it. That's what it's indicating. Not enough people. This is only a small little group. Don't ask me to pray. Not enough people can hear me. Wait till we get the big prayer meeting. Then, I'll, Oh, please let me. Go. Let me. Because I can pray and I want you to hear me. Oh, I, well, I want God to hear you. No. I mean, people have that attitude. I've been in services where people have that attitude throughout my life in various churches and one man and one of our churches. But please don't pray. Please don't pray. And we're going to talk about why they can be inappropriate. Okay, because they're not genuine. The hypocrites, those who in any church age have said, I am an Orthodox Jew. I am a real Christian. Okay. And then they don't act like them. They're the hypocrites. Now, whether they're genuine or not, we don't know. God knows. But a hypocrite is somebody who says he's something and doesn't act it out. Okay. The Pharisees were simply religious outwardly. They could care less, as we know, because they didn't care the, about the people who needed help. They only cared about their own vainglory. So the warning is so stern, and it's very dangerous, because we now have a lot of hypocrites in the churches today. And it said, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father 
who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, there are many people, and I, and I, I know some who are very dedicated to doing this, and I admire that, who really truly do go into a closet. Now, we don't all have closets we can go into, or if you're claustrophobic like I am, it wouldn't work. <laughs> okay, But that private place, and it doesn't have to be a closet specifically, but what they're meaning, an inter sanctum where you can go and not have the distractions of the world, where you can go and you're not going to be tempted to put your phone on or to see if there's something on your email or to go to the door and ask that you withdraw apart to focus only on your father who is watching you in that particular situation and hearing you and yearning to hear from you. Jesus went away to pray. He had to get away from the maddening crowd, didn't he? He had to go away and be with the Father. How much more we need to go away from everything and be with the Father. So whatever that inter sanctum or that room is, that closet is, literally, you know, and I've known people that had, uh, have them, and I know that D.L. Moody or Spurgeon, one of those great men of the said he had his place on the floor in his bedroom where he knelt so many hours through his lifetime that there was wear and it was wearing in the floor where his knees were bent. That was his private closet. Okay. People have those and it may not be suitable for you to have it the same place every time. But the point of this is not I have to get in a closet or I'm not doing it right. That just means that you're shutting yourself off from the world and the distractions. How many distractions do we have today? I mean, far more than they had. Because noise is coming in from everywhere, even when we try to tune it out. You, know, you ever get your phone not to, you want it to go off and you can't get it off and something pops up and you didn't hit anything you didn't think? It's like, I just want to throw it. <laughs> but get away from the distractions. But then, that's just part of it. What else do we need to know? Again, going back to what the Pharisees have been doing. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they shall be hurt. Now, the Pharisees do it also, and I'm going to speak to that. The Pharisees did it in the church or the synagogue to be hurt. But the Gentiles did it in their praying when they were praying for, to one of their many gods. Sometimes they try to use a lot of phrases to get their God's attention. But in the New Testament church now, and as we learn from this, we have to take this very serious about anyone who is praying and using empty phrases, we're not to be like them. And what is an empty phrase? It's a trite phrase that we hear used over and over again, and it's said so frequently that nobody thinks about what they're saying. And we can all fall into that habit. We can get into the habit of saying a rote prayer, not even knowing what you're saying. Is God the man as my father was? He had the same prayer every time for dinner. Daddy. <laughs> I can repeat. It didn't say, I, that's, and I know my dad was deeply spiritual. He knew the Bible almost by heart. <laughs> Why don't you throw in some of those? I never felt I was in a position to say that to him, but it was sort of that, and that's not a, that was, well, I guess it is a criticism. I mean, but, <laughs> but I mean, you know people, good meaning people, well meaning people, Christian people, solid people, who get up and they say, one of two things, I'm in front of the group, I need to sound a certain way. So you're very careful with the choice of words. Because who's listening? Hmm? Oh, you! Oh, who am I praying to? Oh, I must be praying to you. <laughs> Are you going to answer my prayers? Can you? But I'm so aware of you. I'm not talking to the one who needs to be addressed. So we, that's what the empty phrases means. How many words do we need to say for God to know who he is? Actually, none. What we need to do to avoid the emptiness of it, is to pick words that are upon your heart the moment that you are praying. If you have been through a difficult time, for instance, <clears throat> in your life, and have sought reconciliation, 
and you're going before the Lord to pray. You don't need to list his unending names, attributes. You could be there a while. What are you focusing on as you're thanking him for reconciling? You're a God who reconciles. You're a God who brings healing. Speak to his attributes at the moment that you're praying rather than, and this is what the rabbi said. He said, oh, I've heard them say, hallowed, honored, exalted, adored, almighty, righteous, forever, Jehovah. Holy. I mean, he listed about 10. Okay, just get over it already. Kind of, right? Okay. Now, we know, and we, we have learned the names of God. We've, every one of those names are his. They're his attributes. We need to pray them to him and remind ourselves that those are his at times. But we, if we're sensible, if I just run off a list of those, it becomes emptiness because am I going to be concentrating on each one if you're listening? Okay, now this is when I have people around me that are hearing me, and I'm going to list all these names, and I'm thinking, I wonder if they're impressed yet. <laughs> oh, God, did you get Yes, I do mean that. Oh, I've got another one. I bet they never thought of that one. I bet they don't think. I mean, do you know all the, the voices that can come in and cause us to do those? And the rabbi said, <clears throat> he's been where they were. It's like, I can outdo you. Is that what prayer is about? When we, become, when we become believers and we have access to the God that has more attributes that we can name right off the tip of our tongues, we ought to be in such awe of him that we choose our words so carefully. And at the moment when we are praying for something very specific or thanking him for an answer to prayer, that we should choose our words appropriately rather than just list them, because then they do become a list. Can you, Does that make sense? We, the emptiness is when we just repeat things over and over again, and we're not thinking about what we're saying. We're not lifting God up by saying those names. We're edifying ourselves by making sure that people think we're pretty sharp, or you sure know a lot, or whatever, whatever it might be. Now, the the other side of the coin is that in your closet, in the privateness, if you want to pour out your heart to God and names come tripping off of your tongue because you're remembering him or you're so in awe that he loves you and you think, but you're this and you're this. That's genuine. That pleases him and it's worship. Prayer is part of worship. And when it becomes a habit... For public hearing, it is no longer worship. You've lost that. If the prayer is not appropriate in the situation, the people around you ought to be astute enough to know that you, the person praying, wants you to be impressed by them. And I've been in situations where that's happened, and you know, all of a sudden the attitude of prayer was gone to my own heart. Because I was thinking, this, this isn't what we're praying about. Okay? This, here's the situation we all need to pray, and then you go off at all these names and say, No, Lord, we know everything you are, so that's why we're calling on you right now to help us. Mm -hmm. okay. And it doesn't have to sound like you're fluent in spiritual words. Because it comes from a heart. But it also comes from a heart who knows that God and all his attributes. And we have always, when we talk about him, say, aren't we glad he has all those attributes and still loves us? But be careful how you use them. And we don't say them flippantly. Okay? It was just sort of like when we... When I grew up, and some of you, I think, grew up in the same culture, I mean, because I grew up on King James... And, you know, the these and the thous. How many of you ever said those in your prayer? And, and, well, I did. And they were natural, though, because that was my spiritual language from the, the King James. You know, so I would say, you know, oh, 
thou art or thee. I, I would use some of those. You know. Now, at one time we used them more regularly because it's part of our English language. It's not how we speak now particularly. But those things that we're not talking about that. And there's a, there's a thin line here. But the challenge is to say, is this heartfelt? And never use loosely an attribute of God in his presence if it is not coming from a humble heart who is just almost quaking because I can come before your presence. We can't ever come into his presence so boldly that we forget that he's God. At the same time, and this is a conundrum, isn't it? He says, come boldly. But when we come boldly, we have to come with a heart that recognizes it's his invitation into his throne room. And how does that make you feel? You know, when people go to visit the queen, they have to wait for her to give them permission to enter any closer to her. God's already given us permission by giving us his son. But yet we don't want to forget what it cost him when we come into his presence. So we take very seriously that time in the presence of our sovereign God to honor him and then also to remember what he has done for us. And now we're going to make sure our hearts are right with him so we can make our petitions known to him. And it's all part of the package in praying appropriately. Okay? It is not a list of recited words. It's not a prayer that you memorize and say by heart. It's a prayer that's from your heart to God's heart. And use the words that fit you. And some of them, people don't even understand very well. And so you understand by, but the ones that mean the most to you, you know, those stand out when you're praying. So, okay, let's get into the, what the Lord's Prayer. And he said, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before, oh, well, there, <laughs> there is that, before you ask. How many of you are totally confused by that? Ask, but I already know what you need. Tell me what you need. I know what you need. <laughs> Again, that's the Father's will. That's how God ordained our prayer life. You come to me because you're my child and I've invited you. You tell me what you need, but I already know it. But then as he gives us what we need or doesn't grant us what we need because it's not good for us, but he is able to say, now that you have come to me and surrendered all that you need, which is not a surprise to me, let me answer according to what I know you need and what I want for you. And now all of a sudden, we've done our part and says, now you've released me to do my part. So you can trust me with that no, or that maybe, or that wait a while. Or you can rejoice and here it is, enjoy it. But we're relinquishing our right to make demands on our God when we come into his presence with a humble attitude, and then we can commune with him. People have often asked me, well, we can, can we change God's mind? Well, we know we can't because he's omnipotent, but what we get to do is to be a part of what he is working out in our lives when we say, okay, I just want your will. Was God, no matter how many drops of blood Jesus sweated in the garden, saying, can you take this cup from me? But nevertheless, my will be done. Did Jesus know that the answer was anything other than what we know it was? Oh, that was a waste of time. He was showing us. I know the agony I'm going to face. And it's hurt in me physically right now, and I'm going to the only person who can change it, and I'm going to ask you to change it, which God wants us to do. Can this be changed? Can I? But what I really want, because you've allowed me in your presence, Jesus, because I'm your son and I will be obedient, I want your will most of all. Think how God can work on our lives when we do We surrender. Okay, I am no longer mine. I do belong to you. Totally belong to you. How difficult is that? But we're called to do that as his children. And 
our words can indicate whether it's genuine or not. And who knows better than God whether they're genuine or not, right? Or whether we're just saying a little recited prayer. I love, back to my kids, because they're in my life so much right now. And I got little ones com compared to what, you know, what I used to have. When we start our, our first class of the day, we have prayer. And I've got about three, and they're all boys, which will pray. Boy, do I love to hear them pray. That's so genuine, and they sort of get tongue-tied in the thing. And um, and oh, please God, and, and bless everybody that's hurting and heal them and help. And um, no fixed words, no empty phrases, just genuine from the heart. I thought, oh God, you must be loving this. <laughs> and they don't say the same thing every time. I only got three of them that are, I can work on the other side. But it's, it's a, <laughs> you got to be praying too, kids. It's, it's genuine from the heart as best they understand. And that's all God wants. The new Christian, 40, 50, 60 years old, who hasn't learned the words, hasn't learned the trite phrases, can pray the most beautiful prayer to the ears of Jesus than anybody else because it will come from the heart and they'll be struggling because they're not quite sure how to do it, but he just wants us to do it. And he's not grading us on our words. He's grading us on our humbleness and our attitude towards him. So we start in this model prayer. And again, this is the model prayer. In one passage, the, the disciples said, teach us to pray. Don't you imagine that Jesus was thrilled when they asked him that? Okay, you've been teaching us a lot of stuff. Teach us to pray. We're not quite sure how to do that. And by the way, don't you think they were beginning to wonder, ooh, what are we going to be doing down the road? I don't know if I, I oh, I better know how to pray. <laughs> it's a good thing. If all else fails, sometimes we say that, don't we? First things first, we should pray. Now, they knew the prayers of the prophets. They had heard prayers. But they recognized that they weren't quite sure what they needed to say in a prayer. And so they wanted to be taught. They had already recognized Jesus as an astonishing teacher, right? Not like anybody they'd heard. So he'd be the one to ask. And so he said, you start with our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We start in every prayer. We should address the one to whom we're speaking with some form of adoration. But this is where the rabbi got into his commentary and where we are warned by Jesus not to have empty words. So all the attributes of God are certainly not listed when Jesus teaches us how to pray, right? Hallowed, reverence be thy name. We're acknowledging that your name is superior. It's above all names. That's the reason we want to come to you. Okay. Hopefully our lives are indicating that we believe that because that's far more important than the words we could recite. He said, <laughs> Follow, okay, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Now I keep talking about what Jesus was trying to teach the early disciples and what the Beatitudes were about. The kingdom that he will create on earth. It is being created partly by the church as we live like Christ has called us to live. It won't be completely because Satan's still in the mix. Okay, so your kingdom come. Well, what kingdom is that spiritual kingdom? We are in a spiritual kingdom right now, and we know it because we're in a battle, aren't we? Okay. So by saying, thy kingdom come, what kingdom am I giving up and relinquishing my identity with? My own. It's not about me. We've already given up the world because we're in Christ. Your kingdom come. Me. So people look at us and say, you're different. Why are you different? Because we're in a different kingdom. When we meld with the world, when we give in to the pressures on the world and begin to say certain things are okay, they're acceptable, that's not his kingdom. Our kingdom may be losing the battle in some cases, right? Keep praying for the abortion issue, though, because there's a light at the end of this tunnel, maybe. But even, ultimately, we fight for it, but Christ is in charge, but we pray for it to come, meaning I'm willing to be an ambassador for that kingdom, whatever it looks like in my life. And number one, what it looks like is sharing the gospel. Okay. 
But notice it came. Now, ultimately, we're praying, and how many of you ever say during, particularly during this last year, how many of you ever said, even so come Lord Jesus, like now? Is it, could, could you come? You're coming soon. Could you come now? We're, we're anxious, and we're supposed to be anxious. I've heard somebody, well, you shouldn't be anxious. Really? We shouldn't be anxious to go home, to be with our Savior, to be part of that kingdom? He's going to come back and establish it. We're going to be with him. We're going to be working side by side with him. I wish I knew what we were going to be doing, you know. <laughs> but I'd like to get my assignment ahead of time and get ready. I'm a planner. <laughs> I can be getting ready now. <laughs> I can be making lesson plans. <laughs> Whatever. But your kingdom come. Again, the specific message here, although it's to us, obviously, all of Scripture is to us, no matter when it happened, in the Old Testament and what was going to happen immediately then, and the prophets were prophesying about it and calling them back to repentance and all of this. But it's, it's for the day it's written, but it's also for all generations. So, again, think about Matthew and James and John. and They're being taught by Jesus. They're such new followers. And they're talking about your kingdom come and your will be done on earth. They're probably, thinking, what's that going to look like? What does that mean we're going to do? Now, maybe they didn't have as many questions as I have. <laughs> but how many of you have questions? when you? Well, what does that look like? Well, I want to know more details. <laughs> Tell me the plan. He, but he's only giving them what they can handle at the moment. But he also, again, he's saying, this is how you pray. So include these things, the reverence for the Father. Okay, the fact that his kingdom is the one that we're in and we're, we want to be part of. Your will is to be done. I'm laying aside mine. There's nothing harder for any of us than to lay aside our own will. Because that is our nature. Even though we're in Christ, we can give it up much easier. But still, sometimes we want our own way and we stamp our feet to get it. Not literally, but, you know, I hope you don't literally. But, you know, people do that. Okay. Okay, and you will be done in earth, and I love this addition, as it is in heaven. Think about it. Is there anything in heaven that isn't according to God's perfect will? And I always think about this time of year, of what it was like in heaven before Jesus came down to earth. Everything according to his will. I mean, the timing was going to be perfect, wasn't it? Gabriel, are you ready? Where are your angel choir? Are you practicing? I mean, the nativity scene's being acted out up there. That's how my mind works. I should have always been in elementary because I guess that's how I think. <laughs> I'll do that. Anyway, but you know, is his will being fulfilled now in heaven? He said, in earth as it is where? Oh, perfectly fulfilled. Go back to the creation. Was it being perfectly fulfilled? Not one mistake. There's never been a mistake in heaven. The mistakes are in earth because sin invaded earth. Because God created man and gave us a free will. So he said, and then, give us this day our daily bread. Why do we have to be thankful for the bread? You know, I've heard people say, well, we work hard to be able to buy the bread. Well, how do you have, you know, the health and the brain power to go to work. I mean, everything's provided by the hand of God because ultimately everything is from him. Everything that we are capable of doing. Because So we start with the littlest thing, again, as part of our reverence to say, even this loaf of bread that, granted, I worked so that I could go buy, or I need it all day, but you gave me the hands to do it, which, of course, I didn't. <laughs> How, how can you do that? What? It's all from him. Is it? We can't lose sight of the one we're going to, to seeking for him to bless our lives, to give us our daily bread, that through us his kingdom will come on earth. He gives us daily bread. And now we have to go into the part that gets a little more difficult, and that's to forgive us our debts or our transgressions, whichever version you want to use. It means the same thing. And that doesn't mean our financial debts. That means what do I owe somebody? Do I owe somebody? Have I paid my debts? You know, he told him one time, go and make it right with the person. Even if they wronged you, you need to go and have reconciliation. We have to be forgiven of our debts because we need to recognize that we have them. And, of course, we are all debtors, and Christ came to pay that debt that we couldn't pay, right? So we owe him everything. 
But that also means that our lives should be lives that are forgiving of people who owe us debts or who have wronged us. And he even goes on to say that, forgive us as we have also forgiven. Oh, <laughs> I, just, I just want you to forgive me. I have to forgive everybody else? That gets hard, doesn't it? To forgive everybody else? But how much have we been forgiven? What sin is God holding against you? Oh, none. None. But you know, our human nature is not to want to forgive because they hurt me so deeply. Or not to want to forgive because it was unfair. All those things could be true. But we aren't given that caveat. Forgive everything because you've forgiven everything by God. You know, when my kids squabble, and one of them always comes and tells first. And I just said, just don't tell them each other. <laughs> but he hit me, or he pushed me, or he did that. And I said, well, what did you do? And I, did, and I said, well, couldn't one of you have not done the other? And couldn't we just stop, stop it? But he did. I said, okay, forgive each other. Forgive each other. You say you're sorry. Well, he started. Well, one of you say you're sorry for it. You know, if you, have you ever tried to do that interview? Yeah. <laughs> when they come to you with a problem, well, you know it's not that big. I don't want to hear it. You go figure it out. But God is saying, I said, I've forgiven you before you almost said, I'm oh, sorry. How many of us said we're sorry before Jesus came down and died for us? We've already been forgiven the minute we claim him, right? Before we had a chance almost. And so we have to be the ones, we have to be the ones to be forgiving first and to reach out to the other person and have reconciliation. Whether or not it's our fault, this is what the kingdom will look like. And Jesus modeled it for us. He said, <clears throat> and then he also talks about, and this passage gets complicated because people recognize that, um, or, or get confused about what this means. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, God doesn't tempt us, but what he permits is the tempter to come into our lives if we are not, you know, armored up and ready to face the battle. If we get lax, we may be tempted by Satan. But it also can mean <clears throat> that there are things in this world that can, like James says, the lust of the eyes, the things that we see and we want. And so he says, pray that you're not led into that kind of temptation, that you can be strong in it. God isn't going to tempt you to see how well you do. Okay, Satan may tempt you, and God may permit it at a certain time. But you be aware that it's your decision, it's your eyes, it's your heart, and he's going to talk about where your treasure is, that you're looking. So we pray, Lord, don't let me. And you know the area that you're the weakest in. Don't let me feel that jealousy. Don't let me feel that unforgiving heart. We know exactly what it is in our lives because the Holy Spirit convicts us. So we have to forgive. And then we forgive as we're willing to forgive. We are in a position to not forgive people because they hurt us extremely badly. Nope. Because our sin cost Jesus his life. We, well, nobody's hurt us that bad. Have nobody's cost life like it cost Jesus our sin. So we have to be willing to forgive. Now, again... He's talking about a spiritual kingdom. In a spiritual kingdom, with fellow believers, we should be able to live this out. It's harder with the world, particularly the area of forgiveness, because they're not interested in our forgiveness or interested in asking for forgiveness a lot of times, and they don't want to make ends right because they feel good. They got even. That's all Satan's dealings. But in God's perfect kingdom, within a body of believers, where Things that can hurt you from a fellow Christian can be more painful than anything you'll get outside of the church. When one of the sheep hurts another sheep, and the church can be damaged by that. 
how much more important is it for the church to be willing to forgive and for us to reconcile? Because those things have split churches, and you've all been aware of them probably. Well, she wouldn't, and he wouldn't, and they didn't, and they did. You know. In a prayer, we're told, be willing to forgive whatever's been done. And Jesus goes on later to say, be reconciled to that person. You know, there's not options. Have you noticed in Jesus' teaching, he said, here's some of the things I would like you to do. Check off the ones that you feel pretty good about and do them. The rest of them, don't worry. Um, somebody else can do that. I haven't seen anything that I'm exempt from. <laughs> and he's not grading on the curve. Right? His standards are absolute because perfection is absolute. And as we read a week or so ago, he said, be perfect as your father is perfect. And it wasn't a recommendation. Again, the, in the kingdom, those things will happen. But isn't it wonderful to have a glimpse of the kingdom? How dreary and how really traumatic and sad would our world be today if this world and what's going to happen in the next 20 years is all we had to look forward to. But we look beyond that because this is just a vapor. It's going to vanish very quickly. The eternal kingdom is coming, and we're already a part of it. And we have to live with that eternal hope. We have to learn with that its promises are complete. God said it. It's done. We're just seeing it. It acted on the world stage, and then we'll be a part of the final kingdom. Okay? And that's real. That's, you know, difficult because we're not eternal yet. But that eternity that's in your heart that makes you hurt for home and stuff convinces us and makes us know, yeah, we really are eternal beings. That's why this is so uncomfortable. And why we're ready to get out of it sometimes. Say, like, oh, any day, you know, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> okay. Except that he's got things for us to do. Sometimes we have to stay behind. So <clears throat> Jesus goes on to explain that forgiving business. How am I doing my time? Okay. For if you forgive give others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Oh, wow. Now that has been debated and debated in commentary after commentary in trying to explain it. And I think we have to just take it face value and say, this is the model. Because you have been forgiven, you must forgive. Again, not a suggestion. You must forgive. And God said, if you can't forgive, then I can't forgive you. What I believe this means, and, and some commentaries you know, support this idea, is that he will deal with your conscience so that when you don't feel he's forgiving you because you haven't forgiven, that he'll give you a chance to get it right. And most of us have probably, I mean, I know I've been in that position where I was praying and I didn't feel like I was getting very far. And I was wanting God to forgive me for sins. And I could just hear him say, mm-hmm, how about you forgiving that person? I said, really? Do I have to do that? I mean, I had a grudge. I had an attitude. I said, now, is my salvation going to be lost? No. My joy is, and I'm not fulfilled in living out what he's called me to until I forgive that person. And it has nothing to do with this attitude that we have as human beings that they don't deserve it. They may well not deserve it. Did you? I can't stand before God and say, but I deserved it. I didn't deserve to be forgiven. I didn't deserve to have Christ shed his blood for me. So I have to look at the person that I'm having a hard time, and they're in the same boat. <laughs> and sometimes I hear God said, would you just get over yourself? And I don't like hearing that, because that reminds me of my lack of faith and my unconfessed sin and, and my doubting, whatever it is. I said, oh, no. I, I want you to be able to forgive me because I've learned to forgive because you've forgiven me. 
Now, another thing I've been asked by numerous women over the years, does that mean that I have to be good friends with him again? Or No. <laughs> he doesn't say that. You can forgive. That means you don't hold a grudge. But can things be the same in friendship? I think that's almost impossible. And that's just because the gap has been drawn. And it, maybe it wasn't a good friendship. In some cases, I think for a lot of people, we realize that wasn't all that a healthy a friendship for me anyway. But I put up with it and I tried to do the right thing. But what we can't do is have a grudge against them that we don't let go of because God can't work in us. And we want him to work in us. He'll take care of that person. But you don't have to pick up where the friendship left off because it may be impossible. And that doesn't come from a lack of forgiveness. It just because, comes from the things have changed because of that in relationships. And I think um, now there are probably some people who would argue with that. So you can just let the Holy Spirit direct you on that. But there are times when I really think, no, we'll never, <laughs> we can't go back to that. I, I forgive you. I really can. But I, well, he's not done talking to us about how we ought to live, is he? I said, now, when you fast, <laughs> do not look like the hypocrites, gloomy. Okay, now, here's a, a quandary in the scripture. When you fast, that assumes what? Mm hmm and that everybody fast. It was a common practice. It was a practice even in the Old Testament. It was a practice among the Jews in the early days of the New Testament. It was practiced among the early church, which has not been established yet. Okay. So what the point is, when you do, which has been customary, okay, it's not telling you you must, but when you do this, when you pray in the synagogue, that's what he's preparing it. Don't do like who's doing? Those hypocrites, those Pharisees, the ones that were tooting their own horn. Okay, when they fast, they're going, I've been fasting. Can you tell? <laughs> do I look? I've been fasting. But it's for the right cause. You know, it's like people who do things, and they want you to, I said, well, don't do it if you don't want to do it, or if you want everybody to praise you and you want to look gloomy. If you don't do it out of love for the Lord because it's the right thing to do, don't do it. You don't have to do it. You know? But again, do you notice how self-righteous they were? Okay. Do we see any self-righteousness in our world today? Can you think of places we see it? <laughs> Everywhere. Do we see it in churches? Do we see it in from some pastors whose names we all know because they're blessed all over every media there is. Okay. And sometimes they're the ones who make the most out of some of these things to try to get you to do the things that they think you have to do. Again, genuine forgiveness, genuine fasting because you feel like you need to do it to get the Lord's guidance or praying for somebody. Genuine prayer where you are in your closet and pouring out your heart has to be because God is calling you to do it for whatever reason he is calling you to do it, and the world isn't going to know about it. And you're not going to come out and say, boy, I've been fasting for the last 10 days. I think I lost some weight. Do I look better? <laughs> it was hard, but I did it. What do I want her to tell me? Yeah, I look. Was it worth it? How hard? Oh, I, that's wonderful. I don't know how you could do that. I, we know. Why do we know that's what we're asking for? Because that's our human nature, isn't it? Please tell me that you're pleased with me, that you notice those things. That is an absolute wrong motive, and it brings no joy to the Father. That's what we have to grasp hold of. Am I pleasing the Father? And who should I want to please always? Or am I pleasing all of you? Am I getting marks? <laughs> oh, wow, she's. You know. So he's saying, okay, you get your reward. If you're looking for the marks and they give them to you, that's it. That's all it's going to be. But ours is eternal, right? We talked about in Revelation the crowns that we have for various things that we've done. For suffering, there will be crowns. For being faithful in all ways. But think about the blessing you get and having a prayer answered because you went to the Lord with the proper attitude. And he answered a prayer you didn't think. I mean, what a blessing that is. And the world may not even know you were burdened with that prayer. But your father does. And he will 
reward you, though, in front of the whole world. And the world would say, I didn't know they did that. Wouldn't they? And that's what we would want, wouldn't we? Nobody knew. That was so neat. My sister, my baby sister, was the most humble person I think I've ever known. And she did a lot of things, uh, had a lot of generosity in her, and she didn't have many funds to do it. But every once in a while, I would hear about it and come back. And uh, I didn't tell her because that would have, she didn't want that. But I thought, I know how pleased the father is and what a sacrifice that was for you. And one time, my mom did find out and said something. And she was just, couldn't talk about it. No, that's not what I wanted. You know, We need to get to the point where what we want is only the approval of our Savior and our Lord, not the approval of man. Something's not right when we're still seeking the approval of man. And I think that's a difficult place to get to because it's, you know, we all like compliments and we all like to think people think we're doing the right thing. But our motive has, am I pleasing you, God? If I'm not pleasing you, it doesn't count for anything eternally. It only counts for what feel good moments we have here. So he's, he's saying about, you know, they fast so that men may notice them. But again, he mentions that your father will see in secret and he'll reward you. Now, I want to get into this section because this is kind of the crux of the whole matter. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And have we ever seen thieves break in and steal recently? Those gang thing I mean, you think you can't get into those stores. Nobody will get into those stores, right? Armed guards and everything. How secure is our world? And we just happen to have those as a good illustration right now. But we can't secure any of our possessions totally, can we? The, even if we could. The problem is, if that's where our heart is, then we have our treasure in the wrong things. Because everything we're getting here is going to be left behind. Right? You remember the old joke by the Negro pastor who said, I ain't never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. Taking the stuff with it. Okay. No, we're going to leave it all. Because it doesn't matter eternally. Jesus is talking about the kingdom. The only kingdom that matters. So when we're talking about where our treasure is, wherever your treasure is, the most important thing in your life is what you devote your time and energy and your finances to. We all know what it is. And we all know what it's supposed to be. And sometimes we can get our eyes off the only treasure, and that's Christ, and get on other things a little, you know, too much, and he'll get us back on track. He always brings us back on Keep focused on that. The treasures that we're laying up are things that will honor Jesus, not only now, but in eternity. And there will be something that we can give back to him in the way of crowns when we receive them. But the spiritual treasures are the thing that lasts. If you lead somebody to Christ, how long is it going to last? Forever. If you give somebody a nice present, even if it's a rightful present, how long will the present last? Till it's used up or it's worn out or put on a shelf? And it may be appreciated, and I'm not saying we shouldn't give those. We always have to, some people want to take it, you know, to, you can't own anything. You shouldn't want to possess anything. Well, I don't think the scripture teaches that. But where is your heart? Where is your heart focus? Is it focused on Christ? Then your treasures will be spiritual in nature. That is what you will want more than anything else. And what we've been called to do is to lay up spiritual treasures in the form of relationships with people because we're building and growing people into the kingdom. We're making disciples so that they can make disciples. We're winning people to Christ. We're sharing the good news. We're lifting people up in prayer. And if our heart is geared toward doing those things, that's where our treasure is, and he can bless us for that. And they're the things that will last forever. Everything else will be lost. Will be lost. Have you ever thought, I thought about this because somebody shared it. How much do you treasure your Bible? But do you treasure the book or do you treasure the words? I have my father's Bible, and you can imagine, because you've heard me talk about him enough, how I treasure that. And 
I jumped in right away and I said to my brother, I said, you can't have Daddy's Bible. <laughs> I'm going to call oldest and get it. And I have it because it represents his godliness and his study of the word and all this. But when I spoke at my father's funeral, I mentioned that. I said, I wanted my father's Bible because he loved it. But I said, I realize now what he really loved was the word made flesh. And today, he's in his presence. The pages of the Bible will disintegrate. They won't matter. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we celebrate it this, this season. That's why this, what's on it is important. The book itself, I, I love it because it was his. But that came to me when I was speaking. I thought, oh, but it's real. Because Daddy knew the word. We know the word. And that's eternal. And because we know him, how ought we to live? In light of that, and he will help us to lay up treasures in heaven. He said, and nothing can corrupt it. Okay. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And we know that. Think, mamas, <laughs> when that baby came home that first week. I mean, you never owned anything more precious. There was never anything you thought you could ever love more, right? Everything, every waking moment, and it had to be. <laughs> Take care of them. What a treasure. What a treasure. And it was. And think how much we poured into that treasure to build it and to mold it more like Christ, hopefully, and, and to help them grow up and to get the things they wanted and to be the people. You know, our treasure. So we did that, and it was right that we did. It was what we should do as parents. But our treasure has to be deeper than that. It has to be on Christ. But we would do the same thing. Think about what around-the-clock care you gave to a baby. Can we give around-the-clock attention to Jesus? Or can we just be convenient with him when I have time? I got six to seven tonight with nothing on. I'll see you, Lynn. Lord. No, if, if my treasure is genuine, I want it more than I want anything else. And I'm going to go after it. And I'm going to be around it. And I'm going to be inhaling it and feeling it and touching it every way that I tangibly can, just like you did that baby. <laughs> Make sure it's still there, it's still real. Okay, The treasure it comes from the heart. It's not from the head. It comes from the heart. Now, the head's involved because it can cause you to do some actions. So Now, here comes the stern warning. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, then your whole body will be full of darkness. Now, that obviously is an allegory, but it's pretty literal at the same time. You know, if your eye, and we're always warning young people, and you've warned your kids what they can and can't watch, once they get a glimpse of something horrible, even sometimes the things they show on the news, I try to get turn it off if they're going to show horrible scenes. I don't want those, if my eye sees it, what happens? When it gets in your eye, where does it go? Into your head. And then you can't get it out of your mind. You know, And so if your eye is dark and you see nothing but darkness, if you dwell on darkness, if you dwell on negative things, all those things, if you see them all around you, you know, then you're going to have darkness in your soul. Okay. But if you have light, then you see the light around you and you, see, you can see Christ in others and you can bear witness to the light because that's what's going to come out of you because the light is in you. And we're told the world is dark, but those who dwell in Christ, the darkness has been expunded, hasn't it? We have light that comes out. People ought to see that light in you. Wherever you go, whether they like it or not, they ought to see it. Okay, so I said, the metaphor is that, you know, the eye and what's inside of you, but we know that's a reality too. But it affects the whole body. And it says, if the light in you is darkness, how dark is it? How dark is it? There's nothing darker than the darkness, is there? You know what it's like to be in storms and hurricanes, particularly down here, when you have no light, you can't really see your hand in front of you, that kind of darkness. That's what the world is in. Now, they don't recognize it generally. They keep trying to fix it. I think. But he said, if you don't have the light in you, you are dwelling in darkness, in 
inside you and coming out of you is darkness. We read an Edgar Allan Poe story not too long ago, and one of my strong Christian girls came up, and she said, Mrs. Lee, that's so dark. And I said, yes, it is. And I gave him the background. He was an emotionally challenged person in deep depression. He took his own life. I said, this, he was in the dark. And I said, but I, we read this so we see, like you, you wrote, why was he in the darkness? Why did he write about that? He let the darkness dwell in him, and it permeated the pages of the story. But I love that she picked up on it. She picked up on it. I said, you know why you know, Ashlyn? Because you have light. Other people wouldn't. The people that study him and honor him as a great poet, they say, well, he was depressed. That's why he did this. But there was darkness. That was the depression and the oppression. And it came out in his writing. And it has many authors and many painters because of that. It's what comes out of you. It's just like the person, that, these hideous crimes. How can that darkness, that's what dwells in them. That's what they see. But light indwells us. The light comes out of our eyes and out of our mouth and in our hearts and our minds. It's all light because Christ is in us. And he's putting out the darkness. And so that's the promise. But think about that when you're thinking about what you represent. And then he goes on. If the light is in you, or is not in you, how great is the darkness? And I, that's just something to ponder. As how great, I have to stop and think on, how great is the darkness for some people that we try to deal with? And we can't, we can't quite understand it because we're not there. But we have to remember, that's where they are. That's the place where they are. And we're challenged to bring the light to them. But then he warns, furthermore, and again, this is just building and building and building and building. You want to know what it looks like in my kingdom? You want to know what I require? Well, here's the list. And here's the blessings. You know, you will be the light and you will be forgiven. But he said, warns, warns, warns. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be dedicated to one and not serve the other, and he will despise one of them. You can't serve God and mammon, can you? Excuse me for my translation. That's one of those verses I learned in the old King James. When I tried to read it in the new one, I... <laughs> I'm still seeing it in my mind. Man cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve the world and serve God, period. It's not possible. Because one of them is your master. Here's the problem that people wrestle with and aren't quite sure sometimes how to deal with what goes on in the, the Christian community. Because there are are wealthy Christians that God has enabled them to do great things with their money. They're not serving the master of the dollar. They're serving God, and he's blessing what they're able to do. That's different. Some people say, well, you can't serve God and mammon. So by serving mammon, you can't say, well, you shouldn't ever try to get anything or have anything or own anything or possess anything. No, God can use those things. If you're serving him, he can take your great wealth. He can take your phenomenal talents. He can take your ability to reach out to people in the world and bless it and use it for his sake. But you can't split your loyalties. You can't say during the week, I'm going to be, you know, a sharp, on the edge, businesswoman and make a lot of money even if I have to bend the rules a little bit because over here I'm going to use it for good for the Lord. God won't bless that. I can't serve them both. If I happen to be in the business world and God is blessing my business because he's giving me the acumen to do it and I can support lots of ministries, so, okay, great. But who's my Lord and Master? It always has to be Jesus, doesn't it? And he won't bless the person, he won't bless the Christian in the business world or in any world or in any career or anything if that becomes your God. Because I will have no other gods before me. And that can become our idol, can it? And it doesn't always seem that way. Well, I'm working hard, I'm doing this. But Why? For the accolades you get, like the Pharisees, so people see, oh, look at how successful they've been. Or because you can start to give it all away. You know. 
You know, J.C. Penney did that. He got so wealthy and he was such a good Christian. He just said, I've got to start giving this stuff away before it destroys me. You know, he, didn't, he realized that he could have too much. So he just, you know, made a point to do that because he realized that it was from God's hand. It was not his to use except as God dictated. So we'll pick up next week and um, fix, look at what else we have to do. Oh, that not be anxious thing. That'll be an easy one, right? All of you anxiously await that lesson. <laughs> but do not be anxious. And see, you can use that word that way, right? Okay. That's a hard one. And we'll begin. But are you seeing how many big, I mean, think about it. They were baby, baby disciples. <laughs> Sometimes I think, oh, Lord, this was a lot for little ones, <laughs> you know, in the faith. But. They've got to get out there right away, don't they? It's not going to be long before he sends them by twos to get out there and share this new gospel message that is the hope of the world. Thank you for joining us today in Marianne's study of the Gospel of Matthew. If you enjoyed today's lesson, please be sure to click that like button. And if you haven't already subscribed, why don't you hit the subscribe button and that notification bell as we post new videos each week. Thank you again for joining us. Have a blessed day and we'll see you next time.